We're now going to look at an operation on groups called the direct product. And it's a way for us to take uh, multiple groups or sometimes multiple copies of the same group and build them up into a larger one, which is based on the group structure of the individual pieces. Definition 78 tells us about them. Definition 78. Let's let G1 up through Gn be groups. Uh, we want a finite collection here, but other than that, we can take any groups that we like. The direct product of G1 through Gn is the following. First of all, we write it this way, g1 direct sum, g2 direct sum, etc. String them together, as many as we like, using this symbol of a plus sign in a circle. So this is the direct product uh, notation. It's um, a little bit odd that we use the, uh, the addition symbol in here, and our term is the direct product. Um, but um, we will do this for, uh, for historical reasons. There is also a concept of a direct sum of groups, and in all the cases we're going to be looking at, uh, the two notions coincide. However, uh, the direct product is the terminology that we're going to use here. So it's going to turn out that this is a group, but in order to work with it, I first need to tell you what the elements of it are. And the elements of the direct product are collections of ordered tuples, uh, one for each copy of G, and it's the set of all possible ordered tuples where the ith component comes from the ith group. So it's going to be uh, for instance, if there are two groups, G1 and G2, then their direct product will be the ordered pair consisting of an element from the first group in the first coordinate and an element from the second group in the second coordinate. You may have seen this construction before on the level of sets. As a set, the direct product of groups is the Cartesian product of their underlying sets. So this is the direct product of groups definition. In order to give a group structure to this, we need to know what the operation is. The operation on this group, G1 direct sum G2 up to Gn is given by doing the various operations for the groups G1 through Gn in each coordinate. So it's coordinate wise operation, meaning that if I take an element G1, G2 through Gn and multiply it by an element H1, H2 up through Hn, the result of that will be G1, H1, comma, G2, H2, comma, up through Gn, Hn. In order to multiply two ordered pairs or tuples together, then I just multiply them um, in each core, uh, component. Now, uh, it turns out that the direct products of groups is a group. Uh, associativity is um, is straightforward to see because the operations are only happening uh, within uh, within each coordinate. Uh, so for instance, uh, elements of the first coordinate and, el and elements of the second coordinate never interact with each other. Uh, we should note that the uh, identity and inverses of elements of the uh, direct product can be easily found. The identity element is the element formed by the identities of each of the groups. So E1 through EN 
where I'm using EI for the identity of the group GI. And inverses are seen by taking the inverse in each component. So if I want the inverse of G1, G2 through GN, that's given by the tuple with the inverse of the first element, the inverse of the second element, up through the inverse of the third element. So we have identity, we have inverses, and uh, associativity can be checked, and therefore we have a group. So let's see uh, some more. Uh, when uh, each GI is finite, we can say more. The order of the direct product G1, G2, up through Gn is equal to the product of the orders of the individual groups. And this is true for the same reason that the uh, cardinality of a Cartesian product of sets is equal to the product of the cardinalities of the corresponding ones. And now we can see an example. Uh, let's let uh, G1 uh, equal the cyclic group Z mod 2Z, which remember has elements that look like 0 bar and 1 bar. And let's let G2 be the group Z mod 3Z with elements 0 bar, 1 bar, and 2 bar. And now let's let G be the direct product of G1 and G2, which is Z mod 2Z plus Z mod 3Z. And we can actually, in this case, list out all of the elements. The order of G1 is 2, and the order of G2 is 3, and so we should have 6 elements here. And uh, we do, exactly. We have 0 bar, comma, 0 bar, 0 bar, comma, 1 bar, 0 bar, comma, 2 bar, uh, 1 bar, comma, 0 bar, 1 bar, comma, 1 bar, and one bar comma two bar. So there are six elements to this group and let's look at what some of the operations on this look like. Uh, now we can write the direct product either additively or multiplicatively. Uh, it does get a little unclear how one should do it, um, especially if the groups involved uh, are, are mixed if some of them are written additively and some of them are written multiplicatively. For this example, I'm going to stick with the multiplicative notation on the level of G, the direct product, but we'll use the normal additive notation when we're talking about elements of G1 and G2. So if I want to take the element 1, 2 bar and uh, operate on it, take the operation of this with uh, 1, uh, comma, uh, 0 bar, then uh, we do that simply by looking in each component. So first of all, I look in the first component, and I've got 1 bar from the first uh, pair and 1 bar from the second pair, and all of these are living inside G1. And all the elements inside the second coordinates are going to operate in G2. Now the operation on G1 and G2 is addition. So this becomes 1 bar plus 1 bar and then 2 bar plus 0 bar. And now we simply do the operations in each coordinate based on the groups G1 and G2. So 1 bar plus 1 bar is 2 bar and 2 bar plus 0 bar is 2 bar. And, of course, we can simplify this because the 2 bar in the first coordinate comes from G1. We know that 2 bar is the same as 0 bar in G1. But in G2, it's not. It's 2 bar here. So be aware, um, even when the groups that you're working with are... Um, 
written using similar notation, like our standard cyclic groups, uh, you need to make sure that you're handling each coordinate of the direct product according to the rules of the corresponding group. G1 determines what happens in the first coordinate of the direct product, and G2 determines what happens in the second coordinate of the direct product, and they don't really interact with each other. Uh, let's note something else also. Let's look at the element one bar comma one bar inside G. And let's see what happens when we add it to itself uh, repeatedly. So if we take one bar, one bar uh, operating on one bar, one bar, that's going to give us one bar plus one bar, which is two bar, which is which we usually write as zero bar inside G1, and then one bar plus one bar is two bar here. And then if we take one bar times one bar times one bar times one bar uh, times one bar, one bar, that gives us um, zero bar, two bar times one bar, one bar. Uh, just grouping the first two terms together by the previous lines computation. And adding these, we'll get one bar comma zero bar. Um, and uh, we can go through this um, repeatedly. And uh, what you'll find is that, uh, well, we can, actually, we can actually work it out from here. We want to know what the order of the element one bar comma one bar is. And what we've just shown is that the order is not one, two, or three, because it isn't the identity element itself. When you multiply it by itself, you don't get the identity. When you multiply three copies together, you don't get the identity. Uh, but we know from Lagrange's theorem that the order of one bar comma one bar must divide the order of G. And the order of G is six. So if the order of one bar comma one bar is not one, two, or three, but it has to divide six, then it has to be that one bar comma one bar has an order of six. Now let's think about what this means for the group G here. Uh, this means that G is cyclic. And one bar comma one bar is a generator for it. Furthermore, we know from a previous work that a cyclic group of order six must be isomorphic to z mod six z. So what we have just shown, in fact, is that the direct product of the cyclic groups z mod two z and z mod three z is the cyclic group z mod six z. Let me write down that conclusion on a new page. So we have that if we take two, z mod 2z and take the direct sum with z mod 3z, we get uh, isomor that this is isomorphic to the cyclic group z mod 6z. And you'll notice that, of course, 2 times 3 is 6 uh, because the 2s here are measuring the uh, order of the various groups here. And this sort of identification, this sort of isomorphism, is going to be key to our goals of classifying all finite abelian groups. As it's going to turn out, cyclic groups are going to be the building blocks. And all of our abelian groups are going to be, are going to be expressible using direct sums of cyclic groups. So the next question is, well, okay, um, can we always do this? Can we just take the direct sum of any two cyclic groups and get a cyclic group out of it? Well, the answer is no. Uh, so let's uh, let G be a group of order four. We claim that there are two possibilities, that G is either isomorphic to Z mod 4Z or G is isomorphic to the direct sum 
z mod 2z with z mod 2z. And in particular, our example will show that these two um, that these two groups are not isomorphic to one another. Z mod 4z and z mod 2z direct sum z mod 2z 2z are not isomorphic, which shows that the direct sum uh, or the direct product of cyclic groups is not necessarily cyclic because uh, these will not be isomorphic to the only cyclic group that they could be isomorphic to given their order. So let's see why that is. If G has an element of order four, uh, it is cyclic. And hence, G is isomorphic to Z mod 4Z. Okay, there we go. Uh, so what if not? So suppose uh, G has no elements of order four. Now, that means that every non-identity element has order two, because the order of every element has to divide four, the order of the group, but if the element is not the identity, then it can't be one. And we've assumed that G doesn't have any elements of order four. So all the non-identity elements have to have orders that divide four, but aren't equal to one and aren't equal to four. The only such number left is two. So every non-identity element has order two. Uh, let's let A and B in G be non-identity elements. Um, now, since um, B is not equal to A, uh, but A is its own inverse, since A has order two, uh, we have that A times B is not equal to the identity. Uh, but then also, uh, since uh, A and B are non-identity, we have that A times B is not equal to A, and A times B is not equal to B. Thus, we have that G is uh, entirely described with the elements E, A, B, and a b uh, those are the four elements of g under this assumption that it has no elements of order four all right so uh, now we want to uh, we want to show that g is isomorphic to z mod 2z direct product with z mod 2z well we're going to do that by exhibiting a uh, an isomorphism, and we're just going to write down that isomorphism explicitly. So let's let phi be a function from g to z mod 2z, direct sum z mod 2z, uh, given by uh, phi of e has to be 0 bar comma 0 bar, uh, we're trying to construct uh, an isomorphism, hence a homomorphism, and so the identity always has to go to the identity. Uh, phi of A is 1 bar comma 0 bar. Phi of B is 0 bar comma 1 bar. And phi of C, uh, I'm sorry, there is no C, phi of AB equals uh, 1 bar comma 1 bar. Now clearly, phi is bijective. Uh, it's definitely it's definitely um, injective, and uh, because the two sets on uh, in the domain and codomain of this function um, have the same finite size, that means that phi has to be a bijection. So the only thing that remains to be seen is that phi is a homomorphism. Uh, this can be checked explicitly. Let's let's just check one of them. Uh, one of the uh, multiple uh, things we need to check. 
So phi is a homomorphism. Uh, for example, if I take phi of a, B, by definition, that's the element 1 bar comma 1 bar. But the element 1 bar comma 1 bar is the same as 1 bar comma 0 times 0 uh, times 0 bar time, uh, 0 bar times uh, comma 1 bar. But 1 bar comma 0 bar is exactly phi of A. And 0 bar comma 1 bar is exactly phi of B. So this gives one of the multiplications that we need to check. Actually, there are, um, uh, some of them are trivial, but there are 16 different multiplications that you need to check like this. You need to check this for E times E here, then E times A, E times B, E times AB, etc., etc., etc. But once you run through all of those, then, uh, uh, and note that this same sort of relationship happens on each of them, then uh, you'll see that g is in fact isomorphic to z mod 2z, direct product with z mod 2z. Thus, this shows that, um, among other things, this direct product is not isomorphic to z mod 4z, and so uh, the direct product of cyclic groups is not necessarily a cyclic group. Before we look into exactly when the direct product of a cyclic group with a cyclic group is another cyclic group, which is actually going to be quite vital to us, uh, let's look at a couple more examples of direct products in general. Uh, so we can look often at direct products of a group with itself. And in this case, the two copies of the group uh, behave identically, um, uh, but only within their own um, within their own component. So the group R direct product with R is two-dimensional vector space, two-dimensional real vector space. Uh, if I've got two comma three, and uh, operate on that with four comma negative seven. Um, and in this case, we usually do write the plus between them because essentially what we're doing here is just addition of vectors. Uh, this gives us six comma negative four because we just take the two and the four in the first coordinates, the three and the negative seven in the second coordinates um, and work on each side separately. Uh, this is this is sometimes notated uh, different ways. Uh, so, so the direct product of two copies of R is often written as R2, or sometimes when we want to be uh, precise about things, we put a little direct sum symbol up here and put two afterwards, indicating that we're taking a bunch of copies of this single group and taking the direct sum of them together. Uh, we could do that with other groups as well. We could write something like, oh, let's take z mod 3z and let's take the direct sum of four of these. And this would be z mod 3z, direct product, z mod 3z, direct product, z mod 3z, direct product z mod 3z. And we can continue this, of course. We can also get uh, three-dimensional real vector space, which is actually just the direct product of three copies of R together. And the operation of sum on these elements is just adding things component-wise. We can do uh, we can do more than uh, more than this though. Uh, we can use the group R mod Z as the coordinates of a circle. So let's think about what R mod Z means. In the group R mod Z, we've got uh, all the real numbers 
but we identify two numbers together if they differ by an integer. So in this group, one half and three quarters are different, but uh, one half and three halves are the same because they differ by exactly one. And the way that we can use this as the coordinates of a circle is the following way. Uh, we can take a circle, choose some arbitrary point on that, call that zero, uh, and then start uh, noting, uh, labeling points going around the circle. So we'll give a quarter of the way around the circle the uh, coordinate one fourth, then one half, uh, then uh, three fourths, uh, and then the point labeled zero also has the coordinate of one because we've gone all the way around the circle so far. And the point labeled one fourth is also uh, also has the coordinate five fourths, and one half also has the coordinate three halves, and three fourths also has seven fourths, and so forth and so on. So in fact, every point on the circle can be given a coordinate uh, that is unique when it comes from the group R mod Z. So this point right here has the coordinate 1 8, but in the group R mod Z, we could say that it has the coordinate given by the equivalence class of 1 8, because it can be represented by 1 8 or negative 7 8 or 9 8 or any other uh, any other number which is equivalent to 1 8 in this uh, in this group r mod z so we can use the coordinate uh, the group r mod z to uh, to as coordinates of a circle we can create a bijection between the group r mod z and the circle um, so that every point on the circle corresponds to an element of r mod z now, when we start throwing this into, um, uh, into direct products, we get some interesting things happening. Uh, so, let me get another page so that we've got room. If I take R mod Z and take the direct product with R, that's essentially creating a shape where going one direction we have coordinates essentially corresponding to a circle if you go far enough in a direction you come back to where you started just like in r mod z if i keep increasing my representative eventually eventually i come back to the uh, the equivalence class of zero and it keeps cycling around on itself but in another direction entirely given by this direct product here i have a coordinate system which just looks like a real number line, which just continues stretching on forever in both directions. So the question is, what sort of shape is that? Well, that's precisely a torus. Uh, sorry, not a torus, but a cylinder. We'll get to the torus in a second. Let me fix that. That's precisely a cylinder like this. And what's going on is that We've got two dimensions on which we can uh, we can have coordinates. We've got uh, around the circle like we had before, where we've got uh, one fourth and one half and three fourths. Uh, we'll write equivalence classes of those. But then we've got another axis that we can uh, that we can use, which goes along the length of the cylinder. And this one is measured like a like an ordinary number line. So we've got 0, 1, 2, negative 1, negative 2. And every point on this cylinder can be uniquely described by an element of this group. So for instance, one element of this group is the point with the equivalence class of 3 fourths, or comma, uh, 1. So let's see how that gives us a point on the cylinder. Uh, so we can start with either one. Let's start with the, start with the second coordinate. So this point here 
says, let's look at the point on the cylinder with a coordinate of one when we're looking at the part of the um, the part of the cylinder which corresponds to the copy of a copy of R. And then once we have that, we can uh, look at a copy of the circle defined by R mod Z and say, well, where does this point get us? And we see from uh, from the diagram that we have labeled that the uh, the value three fourths corresponds to this point down here. So this is the point with coordinates given by three fourths, comma one. And so you can describe any point on the cylinder using these coordinates, just like how you can use the direct sum of two copies of R to describe points on a plane, you can describe points on cylinders by using uh, a direct product of a, a different set of groups. So now the question uh, naturally might be what happens if you uh, take R mod Z direct product with R mod Z. Is there a uh, geometric interpretation of that? So let's look at R mod Z direct product R mod Z. So this is saying that we've got a circle, the coordinates of a circle, and the coordinates of another circle. But because these are direct products with one another, these two circles should be going sort of um, at right angles to each other. They should be measuring completely different uh, directions in whatever we're looking at. So one way of thinking about what's going on is that we start with, uh, we start with this first circle here. Uh, actually, let me go ahead and, uh, no, we're good like this. Uh, sorry. Um, I'm drawing it sort of in perspective here, but let's say that this is the circle that corresponds to uh, corresponds to the first one. So the first coordinate gives us our position along this circle here, and then for every point on the on this big circle here, we want another copy of a circle. And so what that looks like is that for any point we have on the circle, we should have another circle. And for the sake of, of drawing it, I'm going to draw it a little smaller. And similarly, if we're over here, we got a circle. If we're back here, we've got another circle attached to that. Uh, and when we do all that, the shape we get is a torus. Uh, and it's a torus is sometimes a bit of a challenge to uh, to sketch effectively. Uh, let me get rid of this and uh, and do it again now that we've we've seen maybe how we come up with this. Let me try sketching out the torus again and showing where each of the circles that we're looking at here come from. So here's our torus. And it's a hollow torus. It's, uh, it's not filled uh, inside. But now let me go ahead and give a couple of colors here. I'm going to use red for the big outer circle that we had before. So it starts there, goes around there, and I'm imagining it as sitting sort of on the extreme outer equator of the torus. So the dotted line here where it goes back behind the torus in our perspective. And then for blue, we have the torus, or the circle that's going in the other direction. And now again, every point on this circle can be represented uniquely as an element of the group R mod Z, direct product R mod Z. So let's give some coordinates to our circles that we have. Uh, we'll make this 
one half, or sorry, one fourth. So one half on the other side. One half, three fourths. Uh, that's the equivalence class of zero. Uh, and then on the blue circle, we'll do a similar thing equivalence class of zero, equivalence class of one half, equivalent. Or I did it again. Uh, we want one fourth there, a quarter of the way through, and then the equivalence class of three fourths down here. And so now every point on the uh, on the torus can be expressed in terms of the uh, red and blue coordinates. That is an element of R mod Z for the red and an element of R mod Z for the blue. So for instance, let's take this point right here. In order to tell what its coordinates are, I could do something like this, where I note that it sits sort of above a point on the red circle, which I'll estimate as having coordinates uh, uh, given by this, the equivalence class of 7 eighths. Uh, and then its blue position, its position along the blue circle, I will estimate as having a coordinate of 1 eighth in the blue direction, coming up like this. And so altogether, this point on the torus has coordinates given by the equivalence class of 7 eighths, comma, the equivalence class of 1 eighth. So uh, what is, uh, what's very exciting about this is that we start to see some of the connection between um, algebra and some, uh, some other topics. This is uh, useful in, uh, in algebraic topology. Topology is the study of shapes and form and uh, when one object can be deformed into another, and a lot of what you do is dealing with uh, shapes like tori, uh, like this, and cylinders, and um, planes, and so forth and so on. And when you want to apply algebra to those problems, you want a, um, a coordinate system to put on them, and a coordinate system using uh, the factor ring, uh, the factor groups, sorry, r mod z and r mod z, is precisely the correct one to use when talking about a torus. Okay, so let's come back to the question of when we're looking at cyclic groups and uh, taking a direct product of them, when do we get a cyclic group out of it? And in particular, uh, let, we're going to look at finite cyclic groups. We have a theorem that uh, that tells us, or that that will get us there. We've got uh, we've got um, uh, some building up to do. So let's let G one up through G n be groups, and for each i, let uh, little g i belong to uh, big g i, uh, and let's let it have finite order. Now finite order n i. So we're saying that the order of g i is n i. Then we have that the order of the element g1, g2 up through g n, which uh, remember lives inside the direct product g1 up through g n, the order of this element of the direct product is equal to the least common multiple of the orders of, uh, of all the elements uh, or uh, of all the elements of the individual groups that made up that element. So the order of the pair is equal to the least common multiple of the orders of the pieces. And uh, I, I realized in my notation here, I'm sort of um, uh, doubling up on ends. 
Uh, so I'm going to shift my notation slightly and I'm going to make m be the number of groups in our direct product. All right. So let's prove this. Uh, now let's let uh, L be the least common multiple of N1 through Nm uh, for convenience. Uh, now this means uh, that Ni divides L for all I. Uh, and therefore, if we take G1, G2 up through Gm and raise it to the elf power, that's the same as just taking the elf power of each individual piece. And because L is a multiple of the orders of each of these elements, we just get the identity elements of each of the groups, uh, because L is a multiple of the order of each G. So that tells us that the order of G1 through of the tuple G1 through Gm uh, is less than or equal to L. In fact, it shows us that it divides L, but um, being less than or equal to is all we're going to need. So that means that the order of the element G1, G2, up through Gm is less than or equal to L. We're actually trying to show that it is uh, that it is strictly equal to it. Uh, so now let's suppose uh, that uh, oh, sorry, uh, for convenience, I want to let K be the order of G1, G2, up through gm. Should probably have done this earlier just to simplify notation a bit. We have that uh, the identity e1, e2 up through em is equal to g1, g2 up through gm raised to the k. Uh, that's part of what it means for k to be the order of this element. But by definition, if we take the kth power of the tuple, that's just the tuple formed by the kth powers. So we get that uh, the identity element of the direct product is equal to g1 to the k, comma g2 to the k, comma g uh, up to gm to the k. Uh, hence. That means that gi to the k equals ei for all i. Because the only way for two tuples to be equal to each other is if they are equal in each component. But we know that if gi raised to the k is equal to the identity, that means that uh, k has to be greater than or equal to ni. Um, or, sorry, not, not just greater than or equal to, uh, k must be a multiple of ni for all i. Uh, because if gi to the k is the identity, k has to be a multiple of the identity, or sorry, multiple of the order of gi. So that means that k must be a multiple of ni for all i, and in other words, that means that K must be a common multiple of all the Ni's, and therefore it must be at least as large as the least common multiple of all the Ni's. So here we have that the order of the tuple is at least as big as the least common multiple of the orders of the co uh, coordinates. Uh, but here, we have that the order of the tuple is less than or equal to the least common multiple of the orders of the components. Uh, therefore, they have to be equal. Uh, and that gives us the result uh, in the statement.
So that finishes off the proof. All right, so being able to tell what the order of an element is inside a direct product is very useful for detecting when uh, a group is uh, a group is a cyclic group, and even for detecting when um, various elements are um, or when various groups are not isomorphic to one another. So let's take an example. So let's let G be the group Z mod 4Z, direct product with Z mod 10Z. And let's let G prime be the group Z mod 5Z, direct product with Z mod 8Z. And we claim that G is not isomorphic to G prime. Now you'll notice that both g and g prime have 40 elements. They both have order 40, but we claim that they are not isomorphic to one another. Uh, so let's see why. Uh, let's let g1, g2 be in, uh, be in g. Uh, now the order of g1 divides 4. That's by Lagrange's theorem. And uh, the order of G2 divides 10, also by Lagrange's theorem. Therefore, uh, the least common multiple of the order of G1 and the order of G2 has to be less than or equal to the least common multiple of 4 and 10, which is 20. So what this tells us is that the um, order of any element of G has to be at most 20. Uh, now we could also have seen that a slightly different way. We could have seen it uh, the following. If we take G1, G2 raised to the 20th, that will be, uh, well, 20 times G1 because the components of G are written additively, and 20 times G2. But the order of the first component of G is 4, and therefore uh, 20 times G1 is 5 times 4 times G1, but 4 times G1 has to be the identity. So that has to be the identity of um, Z mod 4Z. And similarly, because 10 times any element of Z mod 10 Z has to be the identity, we get uh, the identity here as well. So that tells us that the order of any element in G has to be at most 20. And what we're going to do is show that there exists something in G prime of higher order. So now let's consider the element 1 bar comma 1 bar inside G prime which is Z mod 5Z direct a product Z mod 8Z. Uh, now, uh, we have that the order of 1 uh, is 1 bar is 5 in Z mod 5Z, and the order of 1 bar is 8 in Z mod 8Z. So that means that the lead, that the order of the element one bar comma one bar inside G prime is equal to the least common multiple of five and eight, the orders of the two components, and the least common multiple of five and eight is 40. Uh, so this tells us that G prime contains an element of order 40 and therefore a G prime can't be isomorphic to G, in which every element has order at most 20. Now, another thing this shows, though, is that because the order of the element 1 bar comma 1 bar is the order of the group G prime, this tells us that G prime is cyclic with generator 1 bar comma 1 bar. 
So G prime is in fact isomorphic to Z mod 40Z. Uh, so again, we have to ask, uh, well, what's the difference here? Uh, we've seen that Z mod 2Z direct product Z mod 3Z is isomorphic to Z mod 6Z. So when the orders of the groups were 2 and 3, the cyclic groups were 2 and 3, their direct product was a cyclic group. And when the orders were 5 and 8, we had that their direct product was a cyclic group. But we had that when the orders were 2 and 2, uh, we did not get a cyclic group. And just now we've seen that when the orders are 4 and 10, then the direct product is not a cyclic group. So looking at this pattern, you might already be able to tell, uh, tell the difference, or at least make an educated guess. Uh, so we're going to now apply this, uh, this theorem 79 to tell us exactly when a direct product of, of cyclic groups is cyclic. So theorem 80 tells us uh, let G1 through Gn be finite groups. The group uh, G1 direct product, G2 direct product up through Gn is cyclic if and only if each GI is cyclic uh, and uh, for all I not equal to J, the order of GI and the order of GJ are relatively prime. So according to this theorem, what happened previously? Well, we looked at cyclic groups of orders two and three. Two and three are relatively prime. Therefore, their direct product is cyclic. We looked at cyclic groups of order five and eight. Five and eight are relatively prime. And therefore, um, their product uh, is cyclic. On the other hand, two and two are not relatively prime. Four and 10 are not relatively prime. And therefore, the direct product of cyclic groups with those orders is not cyclic. So that's what theorem 80 is telling us. It really all comes down to applying theorem 79 in the appropriate way. So let's do it. So uh, the group G1 direct product uh, G2 up through Gn is cyclic if and only if there exists an element um, G1, G2, up through Gn with order equal to uh, the order of G1 direct product G2 direct product up through Gn. Uh, but remember that we've seen before that this is just the product of the orders of the original of uh, the original GNs. Uh, now we also have uh, we have that uh, the order of G1, G2 up through Gn is equal to the least common multiple of the orders of the individual coordinates. Uh, now, we also have that this is less than or equal to the product of these orders. Um, the least common multiple of a bunch of numbers is certainly less than the product of all those numbers because the product of all those numbers is a common multiple and therefore it has to be greater than the least common multiple. Uh, and then uh, we've got another inequality 
we have that this is less than or equal to the order of g1 times the order of g2 up through the order of gn. Uh, and this is just because the order of any element has to divide the order of its group, and therefore it must be less than or equal to it. So, we are, when we ask for the group g1, direct sum g2, etc., to be cyclic, it turns out that's the same thing as asking for this, the existence of some element here, uh, whose order is equal to the order of the group right here. Now we've got this string of equalities and um, and inequalities. Uh, so we have that the order of g1, g2 up through gn is equal to the order of g1 direct sum, g2 direct sum up to gn, if and only if we have equality in these two uh, in these two inequalities if either one of these two inequalities were strict then we wouldn't have uh, equality over on the left and the right which is what we're looking for so we have that this is true if and only if the least common multiple of g1 g2 up through gn is equal to the product of those numbers and if the product of those numbers equals the product of the orders of the groups. All right, so now what we're trying to show is that these two conditions happen, or rather there exists an element g1 through gn which makes this happen if and only if uh, each gi is cyclic and their orders are relatively prime. Uh, so let's, uh, let's look at that. Let me copy, uh, copy down these conditions that we're trying to show. So now we need to show that there exists a G1 through GN with the least common multiple of G1 through GN equals the product of the orders G1 through GN which equals the product of the orders of the groups g1 through gn if and only if um, each gi is cyclic and uh, the order of gi is relatively prime to the order of gj for all uh, for all i not equal to j so this is uh, this is what we're we're doing um, because this part that I'm working in blue we found that this is the equivalent statement to saying that the direct product is cyclic um, the direct product being cyclic is exactly what's in those first two lines, and the last part is the part that we're trying to prove is equivalent to that um, based uh, in order to prove the theorem. Okay, so uh, by uh, basic properties of, of least com common multiple, uh, we have that the least common multiple of g1, g2 up through gn is equal to the product g1 up through gn if and only if uh, the numbers g1, uh, order of g1, order of g2, etc., up to the order of gn 
are relatively prime. If those numbers have any common factors, then the least common multiple of their of them will be less than what you get when you just multiply all of them together. Um, also, uh, since we have that the elements g i are less than or equal to the uh, the order of little g i are less than or equal to the order of the group g i. Uh, for all i, we have that if we take the product of a bunch of numbers and we want that to be equal to the product of a bunch of numbers where all of the numbers in the second group are at least as big as the numbers in the first group, this happens if and only if um, uh, gi, the order of gi equals the order of the group gi for all i. Uh, which implies that gi is cyclic with generator little gi. So what we're doing here is we're taking each of the equations in our top two lines and showing that they are equivalent to one of the conditions in, um, uh, in the bottom two lines at the top of the screen, or the third and fourth line at the top of the, uh, of the screen. So uh, this means that uh, all this, uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, so when both of these happen, uh, we have uh, this, uh, this means that the elements, uh, the, the orders of G1, G2, up through Gn are relatively prime, are pairwise relatively prime. Uh, and that's because the um, we have that the orders of the elements uh, GIs are relatively prime, but we have that group GI is cyclic with generator uh, with generator GI. So, uh, we have that when we have the equations up above, uh, or when we have the top two lines here, then that means that each of the GIs is cyclic, and, uh, and therefore their orders are relatively prime, or and their orders are uh, pairwise relatively prime. Uh, and that... Uh, and that finishes the proof. So we showed that, um, or I'm sorry, it doesn't it doesn't quite finish the proof. Um, we've shown that if we start with the equations above, then we get that uh, each GI is cyclic and GI is relatively prime to the order of GI is relatively prime to the order of GJ for I not equal to J. Uh, on the other hand, if we start with the with the second conditions down here, so if each GI is cyclic with uh, generator little GI and the order of GI and the order of GJ are relatively prime for I not equal to J, uh, we have that uh, we have that little gi is equal to uh, uh, the order of little gi is equal to the order of big gi for all i, and so we have that um, the least common multiple of the orders of g1 through gn uh, are 
is equal to the order of G1, the product of the order of G1 up through the order of Gn, which is equal to the product of G1, the order of G1 up through the product of Gn by the arguments basically um, that we, uh, or the first part is by, by what we noted before. And this is the order of the direct product G1 through Gn. So that means that G, uh, the, the direct product is cyclic. So I'll just stop it there rather than trying to squash some more in. So uh, this shows us that we have a very easy condition to check for when the direct product of two cyclic groups are cyclic. And in particular, it tells us what, the, uh, what cyclic group they are when, you, when we take the direct product. So let's see some examples of working with this. Let's take z mod 2z and take the direct product with, uh, or I'm sorry, z mod 4z is what I wanted to start with. Take the direct product with z mod 7z. Now, by theorem 80, what we just did, this is isomorphic to the cyclic group z mod 28z. And we know that because each of the groups that we're starting with it are cyclic. The first one is cyclic of order 4, and the second one is cyclic of order 7, and 4 and 7 are relatively prime. The greatest common divisor, 4 and 7, is 1, meaning that uh, these uh, the orders of these two groups are relatively prime. Therefore, by theorem 80, that tells us that the direct product is cyclic. But we already showed that every cyclic group is isomorphic to z mod nz, where n is the order of the group. So theorem 80 says the direct product cyclic of order 28, and hence we have that the group is isomorphic to the cyclic group z mod 28z. On the other hand, if we took z mod 2z and took the direct product with z mod 14z, this group also has 28 elements. However, it is not isomorphic to z mod 28z. This is not even cyclic. This is not cyclic since the greatest common divisor of 2 and 14 is not equal to 1. 2 and 14 are not relatively prime, and therefore the direct product of z mod 2z and z mod 14z is not a cyclic group. And in particular, it's not isomorphic to z mod 28z. This property allows us to simplify uh, uh, expressions that we occasionally get where we've got a direct product of uh, several cyclic groups. So let's look at what we have if we have z mod uh, 6z um, direct product with z mod 5z direct product with z mod 9z. Well, it, it turns out that the direct product is sort of associative in that we can group up these two um, direct product, uh, the, these two groups in a direct product together. By theorem 80, z mod 6z and z mod 5z are congruent to z mod 30z, uh, where 30 is 6 times 5. Uh, however, we can't go further. 30 and 9 are not relatively prime. They have a common factor of 3. And therefore, these two uh, groups 
do not uh, combine together in the direct product and are not cyclic. However, what if we had a different strategy and we grouped up the second and third groups together? Well, five and nine are relatively prime, and therefore, by theorem 80, this group is isomorphic to z mod 6z direct product with z mod 45z. Now, uh, again, we're at a point where we can't go any further. 6 and 45 are not relatively prime. They have a common factor of 3 again. But that means that we have two different descriptions of the same group. Now, it turns out that these two groups are, are isomorphic, certainly, because uh, they're both isomorphic to the original group that we started with, but we've got two different descriptions of them. Uh, and so figuring out a good way of sort of standardizing the way that we write down direct products of cyclic groups when some of them combine and others don't uh, is part of what we're going to be doing when we move on to doing our classification of all finite abelian groups. All right, a few more points here. Uh, so... Uh, Let's let G prime and G double prime be groups. And let's let G be their direct product, the direct product of G prime with, uh, with G double prime. Uh, now an exercise is to show that the element or that the subset one direct product with G double prime is a normal subgroup of G, where uh, one direct product G double prime is, of course, just the set of all pairs. Um, or I shouldn't write one. I should I should be writing identity here. That's what I meant. So it's the set of all pairs E comma G, where G comes from uh, G double prime. Uh, this is a normal subgroup of, uh, of G. Uh, we have that it is, as a group, isomorphic to G double prime, uh, where the isomorphism comes from basically just forgetting about that first component, because the first component in uh, the set uh, in this set is always just the identity. Uh, and then, of course, we can do the same in the other direction. If we take uh, the set of all elements that have the identity in the second component. Oh, I should probably actually denote these with primes denote, uh, corresponding to their groups. Uh, the set G prime direct product, just the singleton E double prime, the identity of G double prime, that's also a normal subgroup of G, and it's isomorphic to G prime itself. So when we have um, a direct product of groups, uh, then we can actually think of the two factors as in some ways sitting inside the group itself. We have a copy of G prime sitting inside of G and a copy of G double prime sitting inside of G. Um, and we have, uh, uh, we have natural homomorphisms called the projection maps. So we have projection maps pi one going from g to g prime, which takes uh, pi one of, uh, let's see, a g prime and a g double prime, and just gives the g prime back, basically just forgets about the second component. And similarly, pi two, that goes from g to g double prime, which forgets the first component. 
Uh, and it turns out that the pi i are homomorphisms. Uh, the pi i are homomorphisms. In fact, one way of proving that these two sets up above are normal subgroups of G is by first showing that these projection maps are homomorphisms and then recognizing that each one of these sets is in fact the kernel of one of these homomorphisms. And since all kernels are normal subgroups, that finishes the problem. Now, uh, we keep track of the order of the direct product so that when we write down the notation, we know where all of the elements we're looking at are coming from. But um, the order of the, of the factors doesn't really matter from the point of view of changing the, uh, the underlying structure. So uh, if I take uh, g prime, direct product, g double prime, that is isomorphic to g double prime direct product g prime. Recognizing that this isomorphism is not difficult, uh, we just want to take a uh, function that goes from the one to the other, and literally all it's going to do is it's going to take a pair g prime g double prime and give back the pair where we've just switched the order. Uh, that's really all it is. It's almost trivially a homomorphism. It's almost trivially bijective. Uh, and so phi, this phi here is an isomorphism. More generally, uh, the order in which you write down the elements of a direct product don't matter at all, even with many, many uh, groups. If you rearrange all the groups, then you will change the notation that you use to write them down because you'll change what order the components arrive in. But all the groups that you get out of that rearranging are going to be isomorphic to one another. So you haven't really, uh, really changed anything essential about it. Now, in the previous uh, slide, I uh, pointed out how when you have a group that's a direct product of some other ones like this, you can see G prime sort of appearing as a, uh, as a copy inside of the direct product. And you can see a copy of G double prime sitting inside the product. Uh, and that always happens when you have a direct product. Uh, but sometimes we want to be looking at a, a group and subgroups and naturally want to uh, want to work all within a certain group that we established ahead of time. So uh, let's look at theorem uh, 81. Uh, so let's let G be a group. H and K normal subgroups of G. Uh, that's very important that they be normal subgroups for, uh, for, this, uh, for this theorem. If two things occur, if G is equal to HK, um, now that's written multiplicatively, H plus K if written additively, and uh, H intersect K is the identity, then G is isomorphic to the direct product of H and K. So this gives a condition for when we can recognize a group as a direct product of two of its subgroups. Uh, now, a uh, couple things to note about this before we get into the proof. Uh, in this case, uh, G is sometimes called uh, the internal direct product. of H and K. Um, so internal direct product, meaning that we're starting with two groups that were subgroups of G itself, 
uh, and that satisfy uh, the conditions in the theorem. Uh, notice, however, that this theorem only goes uh, one way. Uh, the, to say that G is an internal direct product of H and K means more than just saying that G is isomorphic to the direct product of H and K. It's also saying that G equals H times K as sets and that the intersection of H and K is uh, just the identity. After after we do the proof, we'll see uh, we'll see why why that distinction is made. Uh, the ordinary direct product that we've been talking about is sometimes called the external direct product in order to contrast it with the internal direct product, but um, uh, that's not universally used and it's not really necessary. All right, so let's see let's see a proof. Uh, let's see why G should be isomorphic to uh, the direct product of H and K here. Uh, so let's suppose, of course, uh, that G is equal to HK and the intersection of H and K is the identity. Uh, we claim that uh, the elements of H and K commute with each other. So we have already assumed that H and K are normal subgroups of G, which is a condition that is sort of like commuting. It's like commuting on the level of cosets, uh, but we're actually claiming that the elements themselves of H and K uh, commute. Uh, commute with each other. So uh, let's let h be an element of little h be an element of h, little k be an element of k, uh, uh, and consider the element h k h inverse k inverse. Now a general strategy for proving that two elements commute with each other is to look at products like this. In fact, this product is sometimes called the commutator of H and K. And if this turns out to be the identity element, then uh, uh, then that means that H and K commute with each other. And we'll see why in a second. We will prove that this does equal the identity element, and then, um, and then we'll see why that implies that H and K commute with each other. Uh, now, we have that h k h inverse k inverse is equal to h times k h inverse k inverse. Uh, now, because h is, big H is normal inside of G, that means that whenever we take k h inverse k inverse, that's going to give us back something that's still in H. So this belongs to little h times h. So this is because k times big H times k inverse is a subset of h. Uh, but then little h times h is equal to uh, is equal to just h back. However, if we group things up a different way, start with the same element, but now we'll group up the first three factors together. We have h, k, h inverse times k inverse, and that belongs to k times k inverse. And again, this is because k is normal. So h times something in the subgroup k times h inverse will give us something that's back in k. Uh, now k inverse, little k inverse is of course in big k, and so that means that uh, K, the right coset of K with representative K inverse is just K back again. So that means that this element H K H inverse K inverse belongs to H intersect K. But we have assumed that the only element of H intersect K is the identity. Uh, so that means that H K H inverse K inverse is the identity. 
So now what we're going to do is to multiply on the right by k and then by h. Now if we multiply both sides on the right by k, we get h k h inverse equals k because when we multiply on the right by k, it'll cancel out with the k inverse that's on the right, uh, the right end of the left-hand side. Uh, but then we will multiply by h again on the right, and that'll cancel out with the h inverse, and we'll get that hk is equal to kh. So that proves the claim that the elements of h and k commute with each other, which, uh, which we can now use in the remainder of the proof. Uh, so now we need to show that g is isomorphic to h, the direct product of h and k. Uh, in order to do that, we need to construct a, uh, a homomorphism, which we will then show as an isomorphism. Now, as always, when we go to construct our isomorphism, we have to decide which direction we're going to go in. Are we going to construct an isomorphism from G to the direct product or from the direct product to G? As, um, as I mentioned earlier uh, in a previous video, typically it's easier to uh, use as your domain the group that you know the most about or that has the most structure to it that you, uh, that you can do anything with. In this case, the direct product has a lot more structure than G. We don't know a whole lot about G. Uh, we do know quite a bit about H and K that we've assumed. Uh, and so starting with the direct product of H and K is probably going to be better for us. So now let's let phi uh, go from the direct product h plus k to g. Uh, and we need to define what it is. We need to start with phi of some element of h and some element of k, and we have to somehow get an element of g. In this case, it turns out that what we, we want to do is simply to multiply them. Phi of h comma k is just going to be h times k. Uh, now, we need to show that phi is an isomorphism, which means we need to show it's a homomorphism and then show that it's bijective. So, uh, let's confirm that phi is a homomorphism. If we take phi of the product of two elements, h1 comma k1, with h2 comma k2. If we multiply inside, as we've written it here, that's going to give us phi of h1, h2, k1, k2. Uh, oops, sorry, a bit, bit of a notational mess there. And by definition, phi of h times k is just their product. So that's phi of h1, h2, k1, k2. So now let's see what happens if we take phi of h1 k1 and multiply by phi of h2 k2. That's going to give us h1 k1 times h2 k2. Now if we hadn't proved the claim before we'd be stuck because these two expressions don't look the same but by the claim we have uh, we know that elements of h and k commute with each other and therefore we can switch the order of the two middle terms and write h1, h2 times k1, k2. Uh, thus we've shown that um, phi is a homomorphism. Uh, phi of a product is equal to the product of the, uh, of the phi's. Uh, so now let's show that phi is uh, a bijection. Um, we'll show that it's an, uh, an injection. So let h comma k be in the kernel of phi. We've shown phi is a homomorphism, and, though, and so to show that phi is injective, it's enough to show that um, the kernel of phi is trivial, which only contains the identity element. So let h k belong to kernel of phi 
so that um, hk, which is v of h comma k, is the identity. Uh, but that means that h is equal to k inverse, and k inverse belongs to k, so that means that little h belongs to both big H, where it naturally lives, and it belongs to big K, which means that H has to equal the identity, because that's the only element that's in both H and K, big H and big, and big K. Uh, but hence, that means that K has to be the identity also, because H and K are inverses of each other in this case. So that means that H comma K is E comma E, that is the identity of the direct product. Uh, so that means that the kernel of phi is the single element E comma E, the identity of the direct product, and hence phi is injective. Now finally, seeing that phi is surjective is uh, was actually part of our hypotheses. Since G is equal to HK, that means that every element of G can be written as uh, H times K which is just phi of h comma k. So that means that phi is bijective, or, uh, well, surjective. So we've shown that phi is injective, surjective, and a homomorphism. Hence, phi is a, an isomorphism, and we're done. So uh, what this theorem um, shows is that when you have certain uh, internal structures, um, uh, you can express a whole group in terms of uh, in terms of various components here. This is very much like choosing a basis, uh, choosing a set of basis vectors for a uh, for a vector space in linear algebra. Essentially, what you're doing when you're choosing a set of vectors is uh, constructing an H and a K, where the direct product of those two gives you the whole space. Uh, now, it is important to note, as I mentioned before, that the uh, uh, that theorem 81 does not say that every time we have uh, G isomorphic to a direct product of its subgroups uh, that it's an internal direct product. So this by itself does not imply that G is a direct, is an internal direct product. of H and K, uh, since we may have that G is, um, uh, or since we may have that G is not equal to H times K, or uh, H intersect K is not simply the identity. So for example, uh, let's let uh, G be uh, the direct product of Z and Z. Uh, let's let H be the uh, subgroup consisting of uh, the first uh, the first factor Z, uh, direct sum with uh, the zero on the right, and let's let um, K be Z, uh, the set zero direct sum with uh, 
with two z uh, on the right. Uh, so now, um, or sorry, let 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 me use a an even simpler example. Let's just let k also be z direct sum zero. So h and k are actually the same here, and in particular, we definitely don't have that their intersection is just the identity element. But if we take the direct sum of h and k, this is by definition z uh, direct sum zero, direct or direct product rather, direct product with z direct product zero. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, when you got the direct product with just the uh, identity element, that's the same as just having um, the group itself. So z direct product with zero is isomorphic to z, and similarly over here. And then z direct product z is in fact g. Uh, so uh, just because we have uh, this condition, uh, as we have in our example, doesn't mean that we actually have an internal direct product. Now, let's look at an application of Theorem 81, which allows us to classify all groups of order uh, that is a square of a prime number. So let's let P be a prime number. If G is a group and the order of G is P squared, then G is either isomorphic to a cyclic group of order P squared, or G is isomorphic to a direct product of cyclic groups of order p each. Uh, in particular, uh, this shows that if the order of g is the square of a prime, then g has to be an abelian group, because both the groups that we're looking at here are abelian. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's see a proof of this. Uh, now, if g uh, contains an element of order p squared, then it is cyclic. Then g is cyclic, and so g is isomorphic to z mod p squared z. That's sort of the uh, that's sort of the the easy uh, version. That's the that's the gimme. Uh, possibility. There's always a group of every order which is just the cyclic group of that order. So let's assume that's not the case. So suppose uh, that the um, uh, suppose otherwise uh, so that every uh, non-identity element of G has order um, has order p. We know that every element of g has to have order dividing p squared. The only numbers that divide p squared are 1, p, and p squared. So if we're assuming that g has no elements of order p squared, and we're looking at non-identity elements, so they don't have an order of 1, then every non-identity element has to have order exactly p. So let's let a be a non-identity element of G. Now we claim that the cyclic subgroup generated by A is normal, is a normal subgroup of G. We're going to try to be building a direct product here and one of, or an internal direct product and one of the products, uh, one of the factors that we're going to have is going to be the cyclic subgroup generated by A. But remember that it was absolutely vital that the subgroups we looked at in Theorem 81 be normal subgroups, so we need to show that um, A is a normal subgroup of G. 
Uh, in fact, this is where um, uh, this is where most of the work of the of the proof comes in is proving that uh, is proving this case, and we're going to do it by contradiction. So suppose not. Uh, suppose not. That is suppose there exists a B in G such that uh, B uh, A uh, B times the cyclic subgroup generated by A times B inverse is not a subset of the cyclic subgroup generated by A. I.e. Uh, there is some N with B times A to the N times B inverse not being in the cyclic subgroup generated by A. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the cyclic subgroup generated by, by this element here, b a to the n, b inverse. And so in order to keep from writing that over and over, we're going to let c be b a to the n, b inverse. And we're going to consider this cyclic subgroup, uh, the cyclic subgroup generated by C. Uh, and we're going to look at cosets of this subgroup with representatives that are powers of, of A. Uh, now, the coset A to the I times the cyclic subgroup C um, is equal to the uh, coset a to the j times the cyclic sub subgroup generated by c uh, if and only if a to the i minus j belongs to the cyclic subgroup generated by c that's how um, uh, that's how cosets of subgroups work um, uh, but we have that Um, the cyclic subgroup generated by C and the cyclic subgroup generated by A has to have order one, uh, and that's because uh, and that's because the intersection of these two cyclic subgroups is a subgroup of the cyclic group generated by A, but it's a proper subgroup, uh, and the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by A is P, a prime number. Therefore, uh, the subgroup, the, intersec the intersection subgroup, has to have an order that divides P but is not equal to P. Well, the only one of those is 1. Uh, so, uh, A to the... Uh, so if A to the I minus J is in C, then that means that A to the I minus J must be the identity, because the identity is the only element that's in both of these groups at the same time. We know that A to the I minus J is, is in the cyclic subgroup generated by A for sure, and so if it's also in the cyclic subgroup generated by C, then it has to be the identity. Uh, so the result is that um, uh, the result is that a to the i times the cyclic subgroup generated by C is equal to a to the j times the cyclic subgroup generated by C, if and only if um, uh, p divides i minus j. Because if we're in this case where a to the i minus j equals the identity, then that means that p has to divide i minus j. Because p is the order of a. So, uh, what does that mean for us? Uh, it means the following. So, that means that the cyclic subgroup generated by c, a times that cyclic subgroup, 
a squared times that cyclic subgroup all the way up to a to the p minus 1 times that cyclic subgroup are all distinct cosets because uh, none of the powers of A that we have in this list are congruent modulo P. Uh, furthermore, uh, C is not the identity because we know that C doesn't belong to the cyclic subgroup generated by A. And so that means that the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by C is P. Thus, uh, the cosets above contain p squared elements. We have p different cosets up here, each one of which containing p elements in it, and therefore they contain p squared elements. So that must mean that G is in fact the union of all of these. So it's the union from i equals 0 to p minus 1 of a to the i times the cyclic subgroup generated by c. Now, therefore, the element b inverse belongs to some, cos to some such coset. Let's say that B inverse belongs to uh, A to the I times the cyclic subgroup generated by C. Thus, we have that B inverse is equal to A to the I times C to the K for some K. Um, but uh, let's go back and remember what C was. C was this element of b times the cyclic subgroup of a times b inverse. So this means that b inverse is equal to a to the i times b a to the uh, n b inverse raised to the k. Uh, now this power here b a to the m b inverse uh, it's got this interesting pattern we've seen before where when we write it all out, we're going to get a bunch of cancellations. So just by way of reminder, when we multiply this expression out with the k's, what we're going to get is something that looks like b a to the n b inverse times b a to the n b inverse times b a to the n b inverse, so on and so forth, b a to the n b inverse. And what we'll have is that all of these intermediate b's are going to cancel with each other. And so we're going to have a b on the left and a b inverse on the right. And then we have k copies of a to the n that are left inside. So we have that b inverse is equal to a to the i b a to the n k b inverse. So thus we have that b inverse equals a to the i b a to the n k b inverse. Canceling b inverse, we have uh, we have that the identity equals a to the i b a to the n k. So uh, that means now if we multiply on the left by a to the negative i and multiply on the right by a to the nk, a to the negative nk, sorry, that's going to equal b. But that means that b belongs to the cyclic subgroup generated by a, which is a contradiction. If B did belong to the subgroup generated by A, then um, when you took B times the group generated by A times B inverse, you would just get the group generated by A back. You couldn't possibly get a different one. Uh, so uh, all of this goes to show that 
in the in a group of order p squared if i take any element then the cyclic subgroup generated by that element is normal inside of uh, inside of the group and this of course applies to any elements uh, any non-identity elements of g so now we're we're just about ready to finish up so now let a in g be any non-identity element and let's let b be in g but not in the cyclic subgroup generated by a so by the first part we have that the cyclic subgroup generated by a and the cyclic subgroup generated by b are normal subgroups of g the a and b here now don't relate to the a and b in the previous uh, previous section uh, uh, but what we proved in the previous section is that if you take any non-identity element then the subgroup generated by it will be normal inside of g all right so this was one of the things that we uh that we needed to prove or that we needed to show to apply theorem 81. Uh, then since the subgroup generated by a oh let me do this here since the subgroup generated by a intersected with the subgroup generated by b has to be a subgroup but is not equal to the subgroup generated by a we have that the subgroup generated by a and the subgroup generated by b is simply the set containing the identity for the same reason as we saw in the proof of the previous part uh, because the order of the uh, group generated by a is p any subgroup must have order dividing that there the only possibility is one all right so the last thing we need to show is that g is equal to uh, the product uh, group generated by a times the group generated by b now the group generated by a times the group generated by b uh, it certainly contains uh, both the group generated by a and the group generated by b uh, but is not equal to either of them since uh, since a is not in the subgroup generated by b and b is not in the subgroup generated by a thus that means that the order of the subgroup given by their product has to be strictly greater than p but we also know that it has to divide the order of g Uh, which is p squared well the only number bigger than p squared which divides p i'm uh, sorry greater than p which divides p squared is p squared itself so that tells us that the order of the product uh, of the subgroups is equal to p squared so g is in fact equal to the product of the subgroups so finally by theorem 81 g is in fact isomorphic to the direct product of the subgroup generated by a and the subgroup generated by b each of which are cyclic subgroups of order p so uh, that finishes off the theorem This theorem is actually, um, in some ways, more impressive than uh, some of the things we're going to be doing in the later sections, because this doesn't, this isn't a theorem just about abelian groups. We aren't making any assumptions about the group G, uh, except that we're only considering groups of particular orders. Uh, but what's amazing about this is that this applies to groups whose order is um, the square of any prime. Even, 
even very large ones. Um, so we can say that any group of order 49 is abelian. Not only that, there are only two groups of order 49 up to isomorphism. There are only two groups of order 169, because that's the 13 squared, and, and so forth and so on. Uh, it really is a statement about a lot of possible groups. Um, this is a step on the way to classifying all finite groups, which is a, a huge uh, body of work. Um, you know, classifying finite, uh, uh, classifying abelian groups was done um, very long ago, uh, but classifying all finite groups was only completed in the last few decades and took thousands and thousands and thousands of pages worth of uh, mathematical work. Um, which is um, one of the largest mathematical endeavors that has ever happened, and that involved the work of, of a huge number of mathematicians. And this sort of result is, uh, is a taste of some of the arguments that they had to make, um, arguments about uh, if a group satisfies such and such conditions, or, and or has such and such a size, then it must fall into one of these categories. Uh, so our next goal is going to be to uh, work out the um, the classification of all finite abelian groups, but I wanted to make sure that we saw this to see how some of these techniques can be applied even when we're looking at non-abelian groups.